Dragon Age The Veil Guard has officially released as of this morning, and with regards to the public perception of the game so far, it's really not looking good. Currently having a mixed review score on Steam, and also on the lower end of mixed, it's getting quite close to a score of mostly negative. The current peak player count is right around 40,000, which some are saying is a great start, yet many others are saying is woefully underperforming. For comparison, there was of course the recent release of Metaphor v Fantasio, which on its first day achieved around 62,000 players. Earlier in the year, back in March, there was Dragon's Dogma 2, which had around 200 130,000 players on its first day. To be fair, it's still pretty early in the day, so we'll have to see how Veilguard's player count progresses from here. Which, by the way, it's also Halloween, so happy Halloween. Now let's talk about the stuff in the game. So, you may have seen some of the clips that were going around, and the ones that I talked about here on the channel, and played on the channel. However, last night, another clip was going viral, and I haven't showed this one on the channel yet. So I'm going to play this next clip, and warning in advance, it might be the most painful two minutes of your entire life. So if you want to skip this, just skip ahead like two minutes. Oh, and one more thing. The context is that Canari character Tosh gets misgendered. Pounding that snake's nose, she's still holding the ruby in her other hand. Maker's panties, I was so proud. Oh, uh, um... Ah, shit. They, they're still holding it. Sorry. What are you doing? Pulling a barve. Oh, okay. A barve? Tradition in the Lords of Fortune, from one of our old members, Barve. Good guy, but like most of us, his plans went sideways a lot. Bad blood among your crew's not good for morale, but there's not always time for big, drawn-out apologies. So, when one of us screws up and we know we've screwed up, we do a quick ten to put it right. Pulling above. Oh, there we go. I'm glad the laws of fortune have Tarsh's back. Oh, Tarsh isn't the first non-binary member of the Lords. Really? It was a little before your time, but Horlix was one of ours. Huh. Bastard looked better than I did in a dress or pants. And out of them, too. Hmm. Any reason you can't just apologize? Sometimes people say, oops, sorry, and hope that fixes it. But they just want to get the whole thing over with. Trust me, I know. But pulling a barve, you sweat a little. Makes you think about it a little more. Shows the other person you mean it. What if they mean it when they say they're sorry, though? And that's the other reason. Some people mess up and get all dramatic. They make it about them. Oh, you know, I didn't mean it right. I'd never do that on purpose. They feel so bad about it that it's on everyone else to smooth it over and make them feel better. Oh, oh, okay, yes, some people might do that. Pulling a barve puts it on the person who screwed up. They made the mess, they fix it, done. This has to be some of the weirdest dialogue they possibly could have came up with. I mean, the whole thing is just so lame. Like, who the heck actually writes like that? I love how they make a huge deal out of this and act like she's so sorry about it, and they're too lazy to even have her hat, like, not clip through the floor. <laughs> it's like doing push-ups and the hat's just clipping through the floor. They really couldn't have animated her, like, taking the hat off or something. And then she doesn't even actually do 10 push-ups. She's like, yes, you know, doing 10 push-ups shows uh, that you're serious about apologizing. She does like four. The whole thing about doing 10 push-ups to put some sweat into it and show that you're sorry doesn't make sense either. For some people, 10 push-ups is nothing. You're telling me Isabella, this pirate captain, can't do 10 push-ups without sweating? Yeah, right, that doesn't make any sense. The other day at my Muay Thai Academy, my coach was so mad at one of the fighters we got that he actually made him do 200 push-ups, but that's not even the hard part. The hard part is 50 of those he had to do on his fingertips, and the other 50 he had to do on his wrists. Like, hands bent, palms facing your torso as you're doing the push-ups and then doing them on your wrist like that, 50. A lot of Dragon Age fans are saying that Veilguard has completely ruined Morgan and Isabella, and the clip that we just watched only solidifies their arguments. There's a great irony to it though, because the people writing the sort of slop are clearly the type to be on social media talking about like empowering women and stuff like that, but they're so disingenuous and terrible at it that they actually take strong female characters like Isabella and make her so weak and pathetic. On the topic of misgendering, I also don't know how any self-respecting trans person could like the representation that's in Veilguard. It just seems so terrible. <laughs> like the worst pandering possible, it's written so badly. People are saying that this is worse than Dustborn, and there's actually an argument that it might be. I also came to this realization about Tosh. Do you remember how freaking weird the thumbnail is for the Dragon Age the Veilguard official trailer from four months ago? Well, the character in that thumbnail is actually Tosh. Such an uncanny and creepy looking face expression thing going on, like the whole thing is so weird and they're like, yes, that's the perfect thumbnail for our game. And of course gaming journalists are actually praising this terrible representation. Apparently they think LGBT people don't deserve any better than the slop that's written in Veilguard. 
For example, SI.com had written, Dragon Age The Veil Guard is the first AAA game to handle gender identity the right way. Bioware's latest wears its non-binary characters on its sleeve and does right by the queer community. <laughs> Let's balance that out with one of the negative reviews that just came in. For example, this one reads, 10 years waiting for Dragon Age Dreadwolf. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. Okay, first of all, let me make sure I understand. My Inquisitor disappeared after meeting Solus at the end of Trespasser, and then he was replaced by some rook guy Varric meets in a pub without elaborating. Then almost everyone from Inquisition, DA2, and Origins mysteriously disappeared, while few remaining characters have amnesia about past events. Everyone looks like cartoon characters, and dialogue is so simple, like it was written by a four-year-old child. I don't even know what to say about emotionless voice acting, robotic facial and body animations, Andromeda, we meet again, no open world, no party control, repetitive boring combat, something just isn't right here. What the heck is happening to Dragon Age storytelling or Bioware storytelling in general? Oh, wait a minute. All the veterans left the company. Skipping below, they talk about the LGBT stuff, saying, On subject about LGBT, Dragon Age always had gay and trans characters, but instead of bringing back old characters that had actual development and story, you know, characters that Dragon fans actually loved, they decided to make replacements that can't even hold a candle, and a main objective in this game is romance. I'm saying this as a female. These new characters are ugly, unattractive, and they don't even have a personality, because apparently writers identify as non-existent. <laughs> By the way, did I already mention that writing is bad? This is just a deal breaker for me, especially in a choice-based game. If I didn't paint clear enough picture, lead director is the real main character, who made the game all about himself, and to do it, butchered the entire Dragon Age lore in the process. Saying you have divided the Dragon Age community would be an understatement in and of itself. Duncan didn't die for this. I'm so glad that this will be the last Dragon Dragon Age game, since after this, Bioware won't be able to ruin Mass Effect 4 as well. I'll pretend this game never existed and refund. Now I'm going to go back to playing old games before I die of this cringe. With regards, a Dragon Age fan of old Bioware. Over on Twitter, Madam Savvy would say, want a glimpse into who's responsible for the quote-unquote super quirky and talented writing we've seen so far of Dragon Age of Veilguard? What I love the most about the writing we've seen is that it truly speaks from a quote-unquote authentic, self-inserting kind of way that is void of nuance in exchange for low-effort knockoff Marvel humor from someone who substitutes reality for fantasy and fantasy for reality. Saying that in response, this other person, Laura K. Dale, who had said, I just got approved to say this. I worked on Dragon Age The Veil Guard. I've been sat on this secret for nearly four years, and I'm so excited to finally be able to tell everyone I'm in the credits. Thank you so much, Patrick Weeks, for reaching out to get me involved. I had absolutely no idea who that is, but I found a Wikipedia article that reads, Laura K. Dale is an English video game journalist, author, and activist. She's known for writing about the transgender and autism communities in relation to video games and for her video game industry leaks. Many of her topics tackle accessibility for disabled players and LGBTQ plus representation. She's apparently published five books, including Things I Learned from Mario's behind, Uncomfortable Labels, My Life as a Gay Autistic Trans Woman, and Gender Euphoria, Stories of Joy from Trans, Non-Binary, and Intersex Writers. Clearly the perfect person to hire to work on Dragon Age The Veil Guard. Madam Savvy added, you're probably wondering who hired this absolutely talented individual who totally isn't pandering. Patrick Weeks moved off of Twitter, deleting all his tweets, but he's pretty active on Blue Skies. The narrative designer had the ability to hire the above individual, who is also writing a novel. I'm certain it's absolutely very different from the writing in Veil Guard. Oh. Including a screenshot where Weeks says, explain your work in process badly post-apocalyptic swords and sorcery queer road trip rom-com. On Laura K. Dale's Twitter account, we can see a retweet of this person, Emma Kent. I find it amusing that Dale's retweeting Kent because this just looks to be more consultant damage control. The tweet having responses locked so no one can respond unless they're quote tweeting it. And it reads, Hello, game consultant here. The idea that consultants are forcing diversity into games is ridiculous because 99% of the time, the devs have already decided they want their game to be inclusive and just want help fine-tuning how certain stories come across. Hope this helps. It's funny that Ken talks about helping, when oftentimes these sort of consultants actively make the games that they work on worse. The writing comes off mind-numbingly dull and devoid of creativity, and the characters are often hollow shells of anything interesting. The representation that they talk about often ends up being written terribly as well, which were clearly seen in Veilguard. But Kent wasn't done there, saying further, the people peddling this conspiracy theory are fabricating rage bait content to grow their YouTube channels and social media followings. They do not understand how the industry actually works, nor do they care to learn, because they're simply seeking engagement. The fact that this has been brought up again in reference to Dragon Age The Veil Guard is particularly laughable. Have the people throwing these Forest DI allegations around ever actually played a Bioware game? To be fair, people probably shouldn't be throwing around Forest DI allegations here, because Bioware itself has been terrible for a long time. However, I don't know if that's just a straw man this person's making, and if not, it seems like they're cherry picking that particular argument, because it already seems seems like most gamers who follow this sort of discourse are well aware of how downhill Bioware has gone. And as for Kent asking if any of us have actually played a Bioware game, I know many of us have. And as I mentioned in a prior video, one of the games that got me into PC gaming to begin with was the original Neverwinter Nights. Kent ends her series of tweets by saying, locking comments now because they're getting increasingly toxic and unhelpful, and I want to go to bed. However, she later claimed an entirely different reason, as if she forgot that she already made the above tweet. This one reads, to the people complaining about comments being off, they got locked because people started flinging insults instead of having meaningful discussions. If people were able to talk about this rationally rather than immediately jumping to hate speech, this would not be necessary. As mentioned, this contradicts her prior explanation for locking the comments. There was already an issue with that prior comment too. 
what she refers to as increasingly toxic and unhelpful, seems to more so be people just explaining why she's wrong, which I guess she really didn't like. Gotta protect that corpo hive mind. Anyways, that's where I'll leave it for this video. Let me know what you think about all this stuff in the comments, and if you enjoyed my coverage, please consider liking and or subscribing to the channel. Appreciate ya, and I'll see you in the next one.